Welcome to the Fiji Symposium 2019 here in Cairo in Egypt, where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio this morning by Mr. Achilles Almansi, who is Lead Financial Sector Specialist for the World Bank Group. Mr. Almansi, welcome to the studio. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming in. Good morning. Now, I'd like to, we just caught you just before you're going into uh, a, a session here at the symposium on uh, cybersecurity simulation. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that and, and of course, uh, about the work that you've been doing over the last few years. Uh, okay. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, with the global financial crisis, uh, we at the World Bank started doing crisis simulation exercises for financial sector authorities, uh, governors of central banks, heads of bank supervision, ministers of finance, and other authorities, depending on the institutional structure of the, the country. And at, at the start, 10 years ago, uh, we were using the, 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 the stories that explained popularly, at least, the, the financial crisis, uh, uh, insolvency, and uh, loan portfolios, etc. But because of my own biases, uh, biases, I guess, I started using uh, cyber incidents as excuse to generate problems in the financial sector that would require the traditional decisions of the financial sector authorities, meaning providing uh, liquidity assistance, supervisory measures, even dealing with insolvency, the, the resolution of a failed uh, uh, bank. Uh, but in the process of doing that, uh, we discovered that many people or our age uh, still think that uh, cybersecurity is a technical issue. For the IT guys working at the IT department, it's not my problem. And uh, what we decided to do is to use exactly the same approach to crisis simulations, but uh, to have these guys dealing with the incidents themselves. Uh, a cyber incident requires quite frequently business continuity decisions that cannot be delegated uh, in uh, the technical people. Uh, if you, for example, have a malware uh, affecting a critically important uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, what do you do? You turn it off? Okay, but you have a crisis immediately afterwards. You don't turn it off, you are taking the risk that the thing may end up producing a catastrophe. That kind of decision cannot obviously be delegated. So we've been doing this. Um, uh, we've done this uh, so far with countries which are uh, pretty sophisticated on the technical side. Uh, the institutional side is the challenge. And precisely because of that, some of these countries uh, have uh, requested assistance on, well, how to regulate the financial system, how to allocate uh, responsibilities, who is in charge of uh, what. And uh, so first of all, we put together a digest of uh, the literature that's uh, emerged on regulations, laws in some cases, for example, in the case of the European uh, uh, Union, uh, and then guidance issued by uh, uh, multilateral organisms like CPMI, uh, the Basel Committee, etc. Uh, and uh, some countries have asked us to compare their own regulations with the outstanding uh, literature in the world to see if we can identify gaps, things that they have not yet addressed, or alternatively, things that they are addressing, but they are addressing in a radically different way and they may want to reconsider, let's say. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, combination. Uh, you start trying to convince people that they have a problem and once you convince them, then I ask for help and we can also help on the uh, regulatory side. When I say we, I mean the uh, small group where, where I work. At the World Bank, we do have additional resources for example, our information security people have uh, developed an uh, assessment tool uh, which is very useful, for example, for a central bank or a financial uh, infrastructure uh, to assess its own uh, preparedness. Then, uh, dealing with cyber incidents quite frequently uh, becomes a national security issue. 
If, if, if you have a, an incident threatening the collapse of the, a major bank or the entire financial system, given the contagion that uh, is possible with uh, cyber, at some point, the financial sector authorities, which in many countries believe that they are the, own, the owners of the thing, will get a knock at the door. They open the door, there's a guy with a green uniform behind saying, get out, this is my problem, because uh, national security is at stake. There is another group of people at the World Bank work, uh, assisting, uh, working with ITU, by the way, assisting countries in the development of uh, national cybersecurity strategies, basically allocating responsibilities on the regulation, supervision, and incident uh, response, uh, which are the, the different stages of the problem. So we do have quite uh, a few resources to, um, to assist countries in need of help with this. Great. You mentioned regulation. I wanted to ask you what innovations do you think are required in regulatory collaboration to create an enabling environment for digital financial services? Well, I have a biased answer to the question. I guess if you ask somebody else, if you want to come up with something different. Uh, I do believe that uh, what we've been doing uh, really matters. Uh, and what we've been doing with our crisis simulations is providing opportunities for financial sector authorities to practice doing what they will have to do in real life. There are many professions who have understood from day zero that they need to practice. Obvious example, the military, but not just the military, the firefighters, doctors, surgeons, for example. Lots of professions fully understand that they cannot uh, start uh, learning surgery the day they open your belly, let's say. They need to practice. Huh? Uh, for some reason, politicians uh, and uh, people close to politicians, like uh, in general financial sector authorities, don't necessarily share that uh, view. And we are trying to convince them that it is necessary to uh, practice uh, decision making. And that's exactly what we are going to be uh, uh, doing in a few minutes here. Uh, but uh, obviously, from the World Bank, uh, we cannot come back to a country, each one, each one of the many countries we work with every six months to do an exercise. So uh, there is a capacity building side of what we do. We normally prepare and run these exercises with help of a local team so that the local team learns our tricks and then they can keep doing this on a regular basis provided that the authorities, we convince the authorities that they need to do so, no? and that's quite a challenge. But that is a, the whole point, practicing decision making in uh, a difficult situations. It's not a, an exam that you can pass or fail. It is just an opportunity to see if you can understand what's going on and take a decision. One, uh, reality is a very complicated thing, of course, and any game is an abstraction of reality. And our games focus on one particular dimension of reality, which is the fact that uh, the pieces of information, the pieces of the puzzle, let's say, are distributed among many different uh, parties. So in order for the decision makers to uh, figure out what's going on, there is an information sharing uh, process that has to take place. And there are many reasons why information sharing doesn't work perfectly uh, all over the world, let's say, uh, including problems of incentives. There are certain things I prefer not to know. <laughs> there are certain things I don't want you to know. Uh, and then, uh, well, uh, maybe I'm not competent enough to explain you in a clear, precise way at the right time what's going on. And that is going to bias your understanding of what's going on. And that may lead to take completely crazy decisions. Now, you better learn those things with our uh, crazy exercises instead of learning it the hard way in reality. Well, <laughs> you're being very modest here, obviously, there, but it, in terms of those exercises, they sound uh, certainly vital and, and very, very important for people to, to take notice of. I wanted to thank you for your, your, your company here at uh, the Fiji Symposium. I also just wanted to check with you finally, uh, ask you why 
this particular symposium. Why did you uh, invest the time and, uh, and effort to, to, to come to the Fiji Symposium? Well, I was invited by uh, my colleagues at the World Bank who have been uh, involved uh, uh, for a long while now with uh, Fiji. And uh, from my perspective, uh, when I hear financial inclusion, and I hear the optimists that uh, the, there are everywhere in the world and uh, particularly under my roof at the World Bank. There are many optimists who think that uh, technology, digital technology is uh, magical and going to solve all problems. And, um, I believe that we, if we do not uh, try to secure the infrastructure uh, uh, if we don't uh, teach people to interact safely uh, with digital devices, sooner or later you are going to have a disaster. And once you have a disaster, you are going to have the kind of picture that you can see in my country. I'm from Argentina. It's a country that has had uh, a financial crisis as nearly since inception, a little longer than two years, uh, 200 years ago. We are experts in producing financial crisis. And, uh, but we are not alone in Latin America. There are other countries, for example, Mexico is another country that has had terrible financial crisis. Once you have a financial crisis, for whatever reason, because the price of oil goes down, or in the case of Argentina, the price of uh, soybeans goes down, or, or, there, or there is a disaster, with uh, financial systems so people cannot access their money at the banks, etc. You know what? They don't, they, don't want, but they don't want to go back to the banks. And you end up with a tiny financial sector that cannot support uh, the functioning of the economy, much less uh, economic development. So if you want to promote uh, the use of digital technology uh, to increase uh, access to financial services, you better make sure that uh, that access minimizes the risk of a disaster. Because the day there is a disaster, then it may take generations for you to convince people to go back to the system. And you know what? Uh, when I was a kid many years ago now, of course, um, I had to go and stand in line two, three hours to pay uh, the phone bill, the water bill, etc., at a bank. Uh, not anymore. Hmm? Uh, if uh, people lose their trust in uh, the technology we have today, you have to go back to those days. But there is a problem. The guys behind the counter 50 years ago are dead or retired. We cannot go back to manual overnight. So the magnitude of a, a disaster uh, derived from uh, a collapse in uh, systems of any kind uh, is, 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 is terrible. So you do have to do whatever you can to uh, help people understand their roles. And that includes uh, the person who is handling uh, her, his uh, account with a smartphone and that is also the governor of the central bank, the head of bank supervision, uh, the minister of finance, many other important people who will have to take uh, critical decisions and if the decisions are wrong, then they will, not only they, <laughs> everybody will face the consequences. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. A pleasure. Thank you very much.